Bruce and Alina had been slaving away at their jobs for three years. Bruce's job was primarily hauling freight in his Ford Transit, while Alina worked day and night as a waitress in the bar. The bar was open 24 hours a day. Finally, at the end of May, when Bruce, tired but full of hope, returned home, his wife said, Darling, I suggest that we calculate our family budget. What is that for? We seem to have enough money. Bruce didn't understand. Well, wouldn't you like to spend this summer somewhere abroad at a resort? At least for a week. Bruce thought about it and realized that he himself wanted a holiday somewhere away from home, where there was no hint of any worries, where there was peace and quiet, where everything went as it was supposed to go. Then Bruce said, You're right, let's calculate our family budget. Perhaps it's enough for a holiday abroad. They did the math. It turned out to be enough not even for one, but for two weeks of vacation, and they still will be able to adequately entertain if they save on the hotel and check into some hostel. So, are you up for a hostel? Bruce asked. Then maybe we can spend more time at the resort. Alina thought about it and said, not in a very cheerful way, though. All right, if that's the way you want it, then I agree. Bruce didn't like that intonation, but pretended not to notice it. He said it that. So we need to start looking for everything we need. What's that? Now Alina did not understand. Are you completely out of line? Bruce got angry for some reason. What do we need? For the rest? Don't be silly. Well, what do we need for the holidays? Oh, I need an evening gown, sandals, makeup. Hearing this, Bruce raised his eyes to the ceiling and slapped his forehead with his palm. God, what a fool, he thought annoyingly. But he said something else. We need a hostel. Bruce said it in an angry, resounding voice. What are you mad about? Alina pretended to be offended. You're talking nonsense. You think of yourself first. Who's going to take care of that? Plane tickets. Do we really need a plane? You know I'm terrified of flying. Bruce took a deep breath, made an effort not to be rude to his wife prematurely, and said, patiently, Darling, I'm afraid buses haven't learned how to travel by sea yet, nor has the railway been laid over the sea, and to go round it would be a huge detour, which would take us half our holiday both ways. But we can cross the sea by ship. The wife wouldn't stop talking. Did you ever go to school? Bruce seemed to be losing control. Open a map and measure the distance from us to the country where we are going on holiday. I hope you remember how to calculate the distance based on the scale of the map. Then divide the distance by the speed of the ship, which is about 20 kilometers per hour, and you'll understand how long it will take us, or rather, it would take us if there were direct voyages from us to our destination. Apparently, Alina had a poor memory of school mathematics, so she didn't do the math. She just looked up at Bruce with doomed eyes and asked, So we have no other options besides the plane? There is the option of going to the sea in our country, but the service, I'm afraid, will not be the best. In the end, Alina agreed to an air flight and started to look for tickets. The search was successful, as well as the search for a hostel. Hostel turned out to be even better than it was expected. Small two bedrooms, shared kitchen and bathroom, a bus. Rapid transit station nearby. Yeah, it's a bit far from the center, but the public transport is good. M.M., and I thought we'd find a hostel by the sea, Alina grumbled. I don't think a hostel and by the sea are compatible, Bruce muttered. The most expensive plots of land are by the sea. The sea has a chance to create all conditions for the richest tourists, which, unfortunately, you and I do not belong to. So make up your mind. Either this hostel or no holiday abroad at all. The wife agreed again. All in all, they had a poorly organized holiday, though not without scandals. During the flight, the wife, of course, huddled in her chair, whispering prayers all the time. 
Unfortunately, aerophobia is a phobia that not all people can conquer. The flight was not without scandals, either, and the reason was the go-around. The thing is that when the plane touched the runway with its main landing gear struts passengers, could clearly hear both engines revving up. The moment the plane took off, it veered sharply to the right, then to the left, and only. Then was the plane able to gain altitude. Murderer. Alina barked at her husband. I wish not to listen to you anymore. We almost died. And there's no guarantee that we won't die then. And this she yelled to the entire cabin of economy class. Bruce looked at her with surprised eyes. Go around in a strong crosswind is a natural thing to do. He wanted to tell his wife, but she wouldn't listen. She yelled again. No more planes. If necessary, you will get me a boat and we will sail across the sea on it. What an idiot, thought Bruce with annoyance. Why did I agree to this bloody trip? Abroad. Next thing he knew, he was praying that the plane would be able to land the second time. Otherwise, Alina will finish me off, Bruce mentally sighed. However, the plane only managed to land on the fourth time. And every time the plane did go around, Alina cursed at her husband. The final part of the flight was boarding the platform bus in a heavy downpour. My makeup's going to leak. Alina yelled. Shut your mouth, you scum. Bruce couldn't take it anymore. Oh, that's right. I'm the one who's scum. You got me on the plane, and now it's all my fault. I'm sorry I ever agreed to go abroad with you. I should have gone to one of the seaside cities in our country. Or better yet, you shouldn't have gone anywhere at all. You could have rested on our estuary and that would have been the end of it. Stingy, cynical, rotten. I repeat, shut your mouth or I'll hit you right here in the crowd. Alina shut up and they went to the terminal in silence. Then she had a bus view of the rainy evening city, checked into her room, and so on. The next morning Alina met her neighbors, a married couple, Mario and Carlotta. They Turned out to be Bruce and Alina's countrymen, though their roots go back to Sicily. Bruce also got to know his neighbors from across the corridor, although he didn't want them to. And from there, life went on. Sightseeing, bathing in the sea, visiting museums. It certainly cost a lot of money, but Bruce and Alina could afford it. Mario and Carlotta also went out with them often. In general, the couples became good friends with each other. They especially liked the nook on the high, about 30 meters. Embankment. Hardly anyone walked here, and the place was hardly lit up at night. But, there was a beautiful view of the harbor and the seaport, and a battered and therefore, unpopular road descends to this spot from above. It's been a week. It was a glorious time. Even Bruce stopped looking at Mario and Carlotta. With hostility, and his wife calmed down, less nagging and displaying her perpetual displeasure. One day it was Mario's birthday, and, of course, he invited Bruce and Alina to a restaurant. It wasn't a cheap restaurant, though. There he told them that he was, in fact, a very rich man, and that he simply did not like expensive hotels. You see, he said, everything in expensive hotels is not real, and a hostel is a lively place in itself and people in hostels are simpler. Do you agree with me, Carlotta? I do, his wife replied. Mario's tongue was a little slurred because he'd had a little too much to drink, and his eyes kept going to Alina, and Alina seemed to like it. Bruce, on the other hand, didn't like it. He was smart enough not to get involved then. Though. And then everything went dark for Bruce. He woke up in his room. There was no Alina. No Mario, no Carlotta. What the hell? Bruce shook his head, his stomach churning. Bruce pulled himself up, tried to remember what had happened yesterday, and realized he couldn't remember. Then he decided to look for his wife. Neither at the hotel nor on the town beach was she present. Maybe she's at the restaurant where Mario had his birthday party yesterday, Bruce. Surmised and raced to the bus rapid transit station. The wife wasn't at the restaurant either. Right, 
We need to find out what happened last night, Bruce thought and went to the manager. He called the waiter who had served the table the day before. That's it. I'm off, said the manager when the waiter showed up. He was a young man with a blunt round face and a fat belly. What can I do for you? The waiter smiled faintly. What happened yesterday anyway? I woke up in my room and I don't remember. Anything. You were unconscious and ill, the waiter said emotionlessly. At the same time his face was as if it had been made of plastic. All right, I fainted. Then what? Bruce became very nervous. The staff gave you first aid, after which you were taken by taxi to your room. What about the others? I'm sorry, I don't pry into other people's business. Bruce sighed. That unemotional waiter, that plastic, face was starting to piss him off. My wife was there. Asshole. Bruce barked. And the waiter, at least he could be scared. But he wasn't, he answered in his colorless voice. I don't pry into other people's business. Bruce pushed the waiter against the wall, put his left hand on the man's chest and swung. His right hand. Talk, bitch. He hissed. Tell me what happened to my wife. Finally, a look of fright appeared on the waiter's face. The man said obediently, as long as he didn't get beaten up. She went with another woman's husband. With Mario? Bruce wondered. I don't know his name. It's the man who's responsible for the festivities. So, with Mario, Bruce sighed. And you were taken to the room by the wife of the guest of honor. Bruce stood for a moment, thinking about the situation, then let the waiter go. Return to work, non-interfering with privacy. The waiter rolled his eyes. Bruce made a fist and the waiter disappeared. In the days that followed, Bruce couldn't find his way around. His wife was still missing. And he was looking for her. A good holiday had turned into hell. Finally, on the third day of the search, just as Bruce was about to file a police report, Alina came into the room. A little drunk, with amused eyes, she said swaggeringly, Darling, I don't love you anymore. Mario and I will get married, and you and I will. Divorce, and you will be left with nothing. You little shit. Bruce jumped out of bed and slapped his wife in the face. She rushed next door, where Carlotta was crying, and called Mario. Look, my husband slapped me. Well, what can you do? He's a bastard. Mario defiantly threw up his hands. You won't even talk to him? Alina snarled. Oh, you mean that, Mario tensed. Okay, I'm coming. Bruce watched the whole thing through the open door of his room. When Mario stepped out into the hallway, Bruce followed. Said to Mario. You wanted to talk to me there, didn't you? Mario tensed up even more, but replied. Yes. So talk, Bruce hummed. Mario swung and punched Bruce in the face. It was a weak blow, and Bruce responded. With a much stronger one, Mario collapsed to the floor, then dashed off. Bruce followed him. It was a hot summer night in the city, and lanterns were burning, and merry people were walking about. And Mario was the only one who wasn't in the mood for fun. He was running away, and Bruce soon realized where. To that high embankment, that dark place. Finally, it showed ahead. As soon as Mario ran into the darkness, Bruce stopped. Gone, you bitch. Bruce thought to himself in annoyance, and at that moment he heard. Mario screaming desperately. As it turned out later, Mario, fleeing from the chase, had decided to jump over the low. Embankment fence, having forgotten that there was a 30-meter cliff and rocks below. Mario's body was never found. A storm that raged through the night swept him out to sea. Bruce's revenge on his wife was much simpler. He turned in her return plane ticket, destroyed all the documents, and flew home at the end of his holiday. Alina only found out the day of departure. Rotten bastard. She screamed when she found out the whole truth. And she cried. You can't leave me here. I'll report you to the police. I've already dumped you.
he said and went outside, where he caught a taxi to the airport. His wife remained on the street, helpless and crying. She soon decided that staying in this country was not so bad. She just had to learn how to make a living. So she started selling her body and soon found an illegal brothel there. She died a few years later because of a severe bouquet of diseases. Bruce himself on his way home met Carlotta in one of the front rows of the third class. Saloon. She was sitting with her head down, depressed, without any hope. Bruce spoke to her, tried to comfort her somehow. Let's go to my house, he suggested at the end. Carlotta raised her haggard face and immediately agreed. Bruce and Carlotta's relationship grew stronger over time, and after a few months they became husband and wife.